the first thing I want to say is actually the title of the meeting as on the program is Is Revolution Possible in the 21st Century? The talk I'm going to give is Revolution in the 21st Century, not as a question, because I believe Revolution in the 23rd Century is an actuality, an inevitability, and I'll try and explain why. You see, the ruling classes always say revolution is neither necessary nor desirable. But at the same time, in the 21st century, the great slogan of ruling classes everywhere is globalisation. Globalisation and neoliberalism. They've embraced a conception of capitalism which involves dropping all the controls on capital, dropping state intervention to direct and tame capital, allowing capital its free flow and free operation. But unfettered capitalism means, and they will tell you this is inevitable and there's nothing we can do about it, it means the sudden movements of finance, the deterioration and running down of old centres of industrial production, the sudden growth, the springing up of new centres of industrial production, and with this, destruction of old ways by which we could live, the creation of whole new areas where people have to live, people having to travel from one end of the world to the other to get employment, or even in a small country like Britain have to after years in which the population of London declines, suddenly we're told it's marvellous the population of London is expanding as people flood into London from the north and from Scotland. The whole reality of globalisation is continual change, continual transformation and so forth. But this has as an inevitable product the sudden undermining of everything which capitalism has told us in the past is inevitable. Karl Marx in the Communist Manifesto made an important point. He said that for pre-capitalist ruling classes, part of the condition of their survival was slowing down the development of society so as to maintain conditions more or less fixed so that the people who've been oppressed and exploited in that society never know anything else. The future always seems the same as the past. People in that situation come to take society as this for granted. He says that under capitalism it's very different because capitalism, by its very nature, it involves the capitalists competing with each other in order to stay in business with each other, expanding production, opening up new areas of production, shutting down old areas of production, creating new methods of production, involving new techniques, new organisation of the labour force and so forth, capitalism, he points out, necessarily continually undermines this conservative notion that society cannot be, the cha cannot be changed. If you like, there's a contradiction central to capitalism, that any ruling class tries to maintain the minds of the people it rules over, maintains mental fetters over them, by creating the idea that society cannot change. That's why most ruling class parties call themselves conservative parties, in the sense they want to give the impression they conserve what exists at present against any change and expect anything unexpected. But the very dynamics of capitalism, even at the time when Marx wrote, was it continually undermines those ideas. As Marx wrote, although under capitalism, the continual transformation of production leads to continual transformation of people's lives, continual transformation of their ideas, so that all is holy is profaned, all that is solid melts into air. When we talk about globalisation, we're talking about a stage in capitalist production where this is carried to its fastest and highest possible extent. When we talk about the internationalisation of production, the flow of capital across borders, we're continuing to talk about the undermining of all the old conservative elements. And yet the very people who extol this process tell us you can revolutionise the means of production, you can revolutionise the ways in which people live, you can upset everything taken for granted in the past, but you can't revolutionise society. There's a central contradiction, and that central contradiction, if you really take seriously what they say about globalisation of the 21st century, the logic is to create again and again crises of a revolutionary sort. Vladimir Lenin, who knew something about revolution, in writing in 1914, at the beginning of the First World War, said, the First World War is going to create revolutionary situations. And so he said to him, what do you mean? Everything is peaceful, there's no sign of revolution, the workers' parties across Europe are supporting the war, how can you say this is creating a pre-revolutionary situation. And Lenin wrote, he said, a revolution is characterised by two things. One is that life becomes increasingly intolerable for the mass of the population. By that he didn't mean that things suddenly, no one can survive, that everyone is driven into famine. 
What he meant is that the small things which keep people going in the past under capitalist society begin to go away from them. Let's be clear, under capitalist society people are not happy. When people say people, when I hear people say people are happy under capitalism, I always think they should, people should, they should, they should go on the bus or the tube at seven o'clock in the morning and see how many people are smiling. <laughs> or, or go on the bus or the tube at five o'clock in the evening when people have finished their work and also it's very rarely many of them have been smiling unless it's Friday afternoon and they've been to the pub. <laughs> For many people we're aware that life under capitalism consists of around of working eight or nine hours a day in Britain, five and a half days a week on average, in a workplace, in that period you're, uh, you voluntarily allowed yourself to be enslaved, you do what someone else tells you to do, you get home in the evening, you probably squabble with your partner about who's going to feed the kids and put them to bed, you watch some crap program on television you probably fall asleep watching, and then the alarm goes off and it's time to get up the next morning to continue the round. And what keeps you going is the expectation that possibly at the weekend you'll be able to drink some poisonous substance that make you feel ill, <laughs> or the prospect that you'll be able to have look forward to Christmas when you probably feel like murdering your relatives. <laughs> but the point about this system is, nevertheless, under those conditions. But what, Mark, what Lenin meant to say is intolerable. Even these conditions, under certain circumstances of capitalism, even these things are taken away from you. The most conservative thing a worker can do, uh, certainly in the manufacturing industry, it's the tradition of you have a clocking in machine, you have to put a card in in the mornings. Under capitalism, even the most conservative thing you can do, the very dyna dynamism of capitalism creates conditions which they will not allow you to clock in and voluntarily be a slave in order to get sufficient to keep yourself in the way which you were used to in the past. What Lenin was saying, conditions under which seed life becomes more intolerable than ever is the first condition for revolution. But he also said it's not the only condition, because he said it's also necessary for revolution to really a real pre-revolution situation to occur. Not only does the working class, the mass of people, find life intolerable, the ruling class also has to find it cannot continue in the same way. What he was thinking about, the situation in the First World War, the rival imperialist powers involved in war with each other, involved in a war for which none of them could withdraw, being driven more and more into a situation which none of them could continue either. But every cap great capitalist crisis also creates these conditions in which not only the conditions of the mass of population become worse, in which to various degrees the ruling class cannot continue in the same way. A great crisis means that some capitalists eat up other capitalists. It means that the warring brothers, Marx's description of the capitalist class, turn on each other. They, and in a great crisis, they turn viciously on each other. Each, in desperation, looks for a way out. Groups are emerged in the capitalist class which have all sorts of extreme ideas on how to try and break out of it. Extreme ideas which often involve attacks upon the conditions of workers, making the conditions of workers even more intolerable, but extreme instances which mean drives towards war, even the extreme circumstances using the police and the secret police to attack other members of the ruling class. Lenin described, and he was talking about the First World War, how the logic of capitalism leads to these situations. When we talk about the capitalism of the 21st century, what we have to say is these conditions are being created and recreated. Now, let me clear, I'm not saying they're being created all the time in any particular country. But the logic of the system as they describe it is to move in these directions. Some of us were uh, old enough to remember the 1950s and early 1960s when the ideology of capitalism was not of uncontrolled, globalised capital. It was a capitalism in which the state could intervene to tame capital. In that situation, we were told, revolutions would not take place, ever, because the state could intervene to stop the capitalists attacking the conditions of the mass of the working class and to stop the capitalists devouring each other. That ideology has gone, and I don't have all time to talk in terms of the, what it, the material economic roots that have formed that transformation, but we've moved to a new stage of capitalism in the last 20, 25 years, a stage in which the capitalists no longer believe it's possible for the state to intervene to tame capital. If the state can't intervene to tame capitalism, capitalism, then you're talking about the recurrence again and again of these crises. And you can see, you see one element or another often. You see, for instance, right across Europe at the moment, 
And Europe is not in a revolutionary situation in Europe, or pre-revolutionary situation, but you see elements of one element. That is when you have a ruling class, like the ruling class in Germany, which has decided the way to solve the problems of the German economy is to increase the average working week from 35 hours to 40 hours a week. Now, to be honest, to be a slave for 35 hours a week is not very nice. But if you were used to being a slave for 35 hours a week, to suddenly be told you have to be a slave for 40 hours a week, it becomes intolerable. It creates bitterness. If, you're, if you have the slow erosion of conditions, which have taken place in the United States over the last 25 years, and again, the United States is in nothing like a pre-revolution situation, but the slow erosion which has meant the American worker today, the American male worker, works 160 hours a year longer than 25 years ago. 160 hours is a month. The average male American worker works a month longer than he, or perhaps his brother, or his father did 25 years ago. And I think the figure for the average female American worker, she works 200 or 240 hours a month, a year, sorry, a year longer than they, she did, did her mother or her sister did 25 years ago. You're talking about the continued, the logic of capitalism at this stage is not a logic of reforms to the benefit of the mass of the population. Sometimes these take place, but the reforms are very, very small compared with the old whole logical system of anti-reform. But the second element is, because of blind capitalism between the competition in capitalist classes, you, could, you do get a glimpse of what it means for conditions to arise in which the ruling class can't continue as before. You suddenly have some crises emerge, in which you suddenly find what was previously a uniform media imposing an almost totalitarian mind way its ideas on the mass of population, some neat gaps open up. I mean, people may remember the pit closure crisis in um, was it, 12 years ago, when suddenly, just six years after the miners being attacked on all sides, treated as vermin and so forth, you had a crisis in the ruling class, a miscalculation about, the, about which level the pound should be at in terms of foreign currencies, huge splits in the government, and suddenly, one section of the media attack another section of the media, you suddenly saw the potentiality of the, media, the blanket control breaking down. It was not a revolutionary situation, but it did create, for some months, demonstrations and protests, the like of which we hadn't seen for a long time, and in terms of mass popular agitation, I don't think we've seen since, in this country. You get something the same attitude if you look in the run-up to the anti-war anti -war period, sorry, in the run-up to the war. You know, we had a fantastic mass mobilisation to, to a large extent because the agitation and the initiative from below, but it was fantastically aided by the split between, within the British ruling class between the pro-European wing, who wanted to take the same line as Chirac, and the pro-Bush Blair wing, which took the other line. It meant that not only did we have the agitation from below, for a brief period we had three national newspapers, in one way or another, open to the anti-war line and rails inside the top of the BBC over what position to take and so on and so forth. Now when you, when you say the creation of a revolutionary situation, you're talking about these two elements coming together. The intolerability on the one hand, and the splits in the ruling class on the other. And what we have to say is globalised capitalism will create these situations again and again and again. Why? Because globalised capitalism means that no national ruling class is in a condition to determine that it's going to live going to float peacefully along for periods of time. You can have a national ruling class, things seem peaceful. If you looked today actually at the British ruling class, apart from the terrible mess the Blair has got them into over the war in Iraq, if you look on the economic side, if you like the Gordon Brown side, you say seven years, slow attacks upon the working class movement, no great disruption, and so on and so forth. But actually, if you're to take their talk about globalisation seriously, that can be no more than floating in a small, a, a calm patch between two great tidal waves. They can do it for a period of time, you can have accidents which happens, but in reality there can be no guarantee of continuation. If you look on a world scale, it's even clearer. You can see that the, you can see whole societies in which you already see what it means to get trapped in the in the ups and downs, the huge waves, the tidal clashes between tidal waves of globalisation. 
I will talk a bit of Latin America. I'm not going to say much because I'm due to speak next Friday for those who of you who, uh, who choose to come next Friday to hear brilliant discussions all day, which mine won't be the greatest, I'm sure. Um, but you look at Latin America. Argentina, 12 years ago, was treated as the prime example, not merely to the rest of Latin America, but to everywhere in the world, as to how a capitalist economy should be run. It's President Menem and its economics minister Cavallo were so cocksure that they were carrying through, embracing globalisation, privatising industry, um, attracting foreign capital at the same time Argentine capital went abroad looking for the best profit rates in the United States and Europe and so forth. They were so proud of themselves that Cavallo went around the world um, as a writing lectures to other capitalist classes on how to behave. If you read, I mean people have probably seen the quotation of Business Week, I think 1992, Argentina is the country which shows how neoliberalism can work, how we can get rid of crises, how we get rid of inflation, how we get rid of unemployment and so forth. And then you look at Argentina in the, just two and a half years ago, the sudden eruption of an economic crisis, an economic crisis in which the ruling class could not survive in the old way. The ruling class to survive had to slash the wages uh, at the salaries of people in the public sector, seize the pension funds of people in the public sector, freeze the bank accounts, effectively expropriate the savings of the whole of the middle class and the better off section of the working class and push through unemployment, shut down unemployment to levels of 20 or 30 percent. Creating a climate in which suddenly people, the, the, the ruling class was no longer coherent, the ruling class round each other, what can we do, how can we deal with this situation, hits out the working class, the mass of population, suddenly forced, intolerable situation, they erupt on the street, the Argentine president has to flee the presidential palace in a helicopter, and it's not just Argentina, you look at Ecuador, you look at Bolivia, a situation in which in three, in three years, three governments are driven out of power by mass agitation in the streets, Ecuador, Argentina, and then Bolivia. Now, you can think these places are distant and far away, but these exemplify a certain issue when to talk the weaker capitalist countries, not the poorest capitalist countries. Actually, Bolivia and Ecuador are very, very poor, but Argentina was never the poorest capitalist country. It was actually the richest capitalist country in Latin America, a country whose economy historically was at the level of Greece or Portugal, and if you go far enough back at a higher level than Italy and Spain, how a, a country like that, a country like that, caught in the sudden impact of the world's system, is broken apart, and what is created is a classic pre-revolutionary situation. There's been lots of discussion. A pre-revolutionary situation is not. I come back to this. It's not a situation that leads automatically to revolution. But you cannot read about the events in Bolivia or Ecuador or most recently, sorry, or Argentina, without having some sense of this is what it's about. And what we have to say is, that is not unique. I could talk about other places in the world which governments have been overthrown. Serbia, Georgia, um, Indonesia, Albania. It's the overthrow of governments by people marching on the presidential palace and the police having to choose between shooting people down and creating a complete revolution and the president fleeing has become quite the norm in the 21st century. And what we have to say is the logic is, the logic of globalisation is not to restrict it to just some parts of the world, because under these circumstances, even what seems sta stable, secure capitalist states, the ruling classes can make exactly the same miscalculations made in Argentina, and you can suddenly find the thing opening up and bursting apart. And something else should be said. The two elements of the revolutionary situation are, are separate, but of course one can have an effect on the other. The a growth in non-political, not particularly conscious militancy of the working class can create a situation in which the ruling class cannot continue in the same way, and similarly the crisis of the ruling class can force it to hit out in any direction. But you create a situation, a pre-revolutionary situation, let's describe it like this. We're used to situations in which politics is what people like us talk about. But people you meet at the bus stop talk, may talk about it in a pre-election, in a pre-election, and maybe they talk about it in Leicester or Birmingham, but by and large, you're regarded as a bit weird, your obsession with politics. A pre-revolutionary pre -revolutionary situation is a situation in which everyone in society is discussing which way can we go forward now. 
In Argentina two years ago, you couldn't talk to someone driving a bus or driving a taxi or waiting in a bus queue without them talking. What's going to happen next? How would we solve the problem? You can't talk about without people about extreme solutions being put forward by all classes in that society. People at the base begin to think possibly we could run things ourselves. People in the ruling class thinking should we have a military dictatorship? Should we do this? Should we do that? Extreme, in, extreme politics comes to the fore. And I mean I've, I've only been in through my life I think I've been in three situations which have been a bit like this and they've not been fully revolutionary situations. France in 1968 I went to Paris in June 68 because I had to do a meeting in Manchester in May. Um, but even, in the beginning of, even at the beginning of June 1968, there was that sense they had a, the, the, the left, the student had a newspaper called Axion. And it was not like selling social work on the streets. It's like to be like you'd like to dream of selling social work on the streets. They'd produce 200 copies uh, in a crowd and they'd be gone in, in literally two minutes. A situation in which everyone is talking politics. Or Portugal in 1974. We went for a holiday in a little seaside resort near, near Lisbon. And there was a paper produced by a revolutionary organisation. Um, I think the paper's called Revolution. And they had it in the shop by the beach, next to the beach balls and the, and the buckets and spades. And they were selling 40 cups a week off the, off the thing. It's, a Maoist poster up on the wall, and people come and look at it and reading it, reading every word on it. Or in Argentina, to suddenly find in any locality, you know, um, as if in the bit there, Hackney and I live in Shoreditch, you suddenly have a local committee or organising meetings to which 100 people turn up to discuss how do we change society. This is the situation we're talking about, a revolutionary situation. And what really we have to understand, these situations were created again and again in the 21st century. In a certain sense, globalisation means the speed at which capitalism operates has moved faster, moved more violently, more wildly in the 21st century. Those situations we are created more, even more. Something else, of course, has to be said. Lenin was very careful to make a distinction between a revolutionary situation and a revolution. And it's an important distinction. A revolutionary situation is where everyone in society is talking about how to change society, in which the ruling class is divided, doesn't know the way forward, in which sectors of the ruling class reach extreme ideas, in which masses of people move on the streets, get rid of one government, begin to discuss what they replace it by. A revolutionary situation, that's a revolutionary situation. But even a revolutionary situation is not the same as the end of the ruling class, because the ruling class continues to be there, even in Petrograd in April and May and June 1917, the capitalist class continued to produce their daily papers, their newspapers, their daily, probably their new sports papers, all the things designed to divert people from talking about real issues. They could build up a scare that Lenin was a German agent and force him to go into hiding. They could create all those, all that element was there. Power in the factories remained in, in, the, fa in the hands of the factory owners, face of the discontent among the workers, they began to shut close factories down to sack workers and so forth. Capitalism remained intact. In Portugal in 1975, there was some, many, some of the mainstream papers were affected by the revolution ferment. One of the papers was taken over by the workers who produced it, but the main capitalist papers continued to come out and put out pro-capitalist propaganda. In Argentina, two and a half years ago, the ruling capitalist class was terrified. The problem that members of the capitalist class did not dare go out in public because people have come around organising what they call a scratches, a public denunciation of you, people running around pointing at you and banging pots and pans and insulting you. But nevertheless, every day the capitalist press came out. The capitalist press, the liberal press saying you don't need a revolution, the right-wing press saying we need a military dictatorship. Every day the, the factories continue to be in the hands of the capitalist class who continued to sack people because they faced a gigantic economic crisis. You had a revolutionary situation in terms of potential began to see people to see the potential to change society, you don't have a revolution. And therefore for, for us we have to understand the revolutionary situations are created by capitalism. And it's very, very important. There's a very, very bad slogan, subject to Che Guevara, I say, because he pictures these all over Marxism. Uh, 
those of us older generation to prefer pictures of Trotsky and Rosa Luxemburg, I suppose, have to bear this. But, um, the, but a very bad slogan from Che Guevara, if you're a revolutionary, make a revolution. If you're a revolutionary, you do not create the revolutionary situation. The revolutionary situation is created by the impact of capitalism upon the consciousness of the mass of the population, or the impact of the contradictions of tearing a capitalist society apart upon the consciousness of the mass of the population. But when you have a revolutionary situation created, at that point, what becomes important is the arguments about the way forward. And those arguments invariably create a polarization within the people who just carried through the great first thrust of the revolutionary movement. Every great revolution, the first great thrust forward is spontaneous. The, the, um, the, the, the march on Versailles in, in 1789, the February Revolution in 1917, the, um, the overthrow of the fascism, well it wasn't not quite spontaneous, it was all the military coup, but there was this sense of spontaneity of everyone being on the same side in Portugal in 1974. But once you've, that's happened, then inevitably, among the very people who've been involved in the revolutionary overthrow, becomes a discussion on the way forward. And invariably, three currents emerge within that, and it's quite important to understand. First, are the people who understand the need for the revolution to go to the, all the way through. But let's be clear, the people who just made the revolution, the revolutionary upsurge, have been brought up in the old society. They've never known anything other than the old society. That low as if all of us have been brought up in a world wearing blue tinted glasses. You wouldn't know what it was if someone said that such and such is white or such and such is pink. You'd always see it in a distorted way. And the great bulk of people, even after they've made the beginning of a revolution, still cannot conceive the idea that society's totality could be changed. So there's only a small minority, through various accidents, through someone talking to them, or through experience in the past, had the understanding of the full revolution. At the other extreme, there's always a minority who've broken not one inch with the old ideas, who continue to believe, even, you know, even after you've overthrown the Tsar, that really it's all manipulation by the Jews, that the, somehow the Tsar was a good man, has been overthrown unnecessarily, all the reaction ideas there. And I say, after the, the British Revolution, I'm sorry, the day after the British Revolution, there will still be racists and anti-Semites and people who hate Muslims and so forth. There'll be a minority, but they'll exist. And there'll be, on, with that minority, of course, because the capitalist media continue to exist, you'll still have newspapers called The Sun, unfortunately, or The Express, or The Mail, continue to try and feed and encourage those ideas. And, in the, and so you have the two extremes. And some people say they want a spontaneous revolution, they don't believe in party. But once you talk about the two extremes, you're talking about two parties, whether they're called parties or not. A party of the people who want to carry, carry things through the end of the revolutionary party, and a party of people who want to stop it, a counter-revolutionary party. In every great revolution, however, the, the middle element is usually the majority for a period. And it's quite important. You sometimes hear people say, we live in a world where reforms are not possible, therefore reformism is ended. I've got news for you. Every great revolution, the majority of people, the day after the revolution, stand for some sort of reformist solution. They want to change society more than in the past. They want a better life than they ever dreamt of in the past. But they do not believe you can do it without somehow working with the existing society. And therefore, the, every great revolution, the same people overthrew the Tsar, the next day accept a government headed by Prince Lvov, a war profiteer, and follow Prince Lvov, government headed by Kerensky, a classic reformist, someone who wanted to defend capitalism to the end, but said he wanted reforms for workers in capitalism. After the great Hungarian revolution in 1956, the workers, overthrew, drove, the workers drove, overthrew the system, drove up the Russian army, and then turned to a man called Imre Nodge to be Prime Minister. Imre Nodge, why? Because he's the best known person in the old ruling group. The idea that there's no situation in which workers automatically overthrow the old system and then march straight forward. There's always an interim period. And the interim period, what characterises it, is always a fight for the ideas of the majority of the population between a revolutionary current and a counter-revolutionary current with a big mishmash in the middle of people who accept the need for some change, accept the need for others. And that's why when you look at the revolutions in the 20th century, and the same will be true in the 21st century, 
You always feel this feeling of this loss, this period in which if only they had moved further forward, more quickly, the thing would have been successful. Um, except with the exception, in terms of workers' revolution, except with the exception of the Russian Revolution, the tragedy was, when it came to it, they didn't move forward. In Germany in 1918, 1919, they could have moved forward. They could have followed Rosa Luxemburg, Karl Liebknecht. They didn't. They followed vacillators, people who stood for some half reform of the system, Hilferding or Scheidemann, some on the left, some on the right, and let the opportunity fail. You look at, I could go on about 1936 in Spain, in Barcelona, the potentiality was there to carry through a workers' revolution without any more bloodshed once they'd destroyed the fascist coup. And instead, they vacillated, they looked towards Caballero, not Caballero, Caballero and Campanis, and, and even in Reno, um, even Andre Nien made the mistake of thinking there's no alternative but to join this government. You always have that situation. That's why for us, when we talk about, when we say that revolution is an inevitability in the sense of a general possibility of capitalism going for a hundred years through the 21st century without succession of major breakthroughs, major pre-revolutionary situations, just as we've seen in Latin America in the last three years. It doesn't mean the revolution will be that's automatic, which leads to the last thing, which is why we have to talk always. You want to talk about revolution as being an actuality. You also have to say the, the finishing point of revolution is the building a revolutionary organisation. I want to finish on this, because I think for us it's the key thing. What we have to stand, there's two false models of what revolutionary organisation is. One really follows from this old slogan, if you're revolutionary, make a revolution, that somehow the revolutionaries do it for everyone else. This is the model in which really, those in this room would say, we're revolutionaries, let's start plats, let's start the arm training now. Let's practice the insurrection. Let's work out which buildings we have to take over in central London and we'll sit back and wait for the time to come. That may serve a caricature, but there was a great French revolution in the 19th century, Blanqui, whose method essentially was this. And Blanqui's tragedy was, because he didn't understand what created a revolution situation, he got arrested three months before the Paris Commune. Whereas if he'd been lived through the Paris Commune, the Paris Commune would probably established uh, a work of state which lasted rather longer than it did because he did understand stuff about revolutionary warfare and fighting and so forth. In the 1920-21 period, in Italy, there was a, a revolutionary Bordiga who was not quite as, not quite this n- narrow an atmosphere, but basically his line was, you build the revolutionary party, you build it by talk about revolutionary propaganda, the need for revolution, you do not get involved in day-to-day struggles over reforms, you certainly don't get involved in electioneering, you build the party as something separate to the class. That's one misconception, because it doesn't understand that it's not the revolutionary organisation that creates the revolutionary situation, the revolutionary situation erupts, and then the revolutionary organisation is important insofar as it's able to argue and give direction to people. The other misconception is somewhere very similar to it, and this is the idea that okay, we can't make the revolution now, we can do, but we can make propaganda, we can take part in elections once every two or three years, we will get people, ele- we'll build up our votes slowly over the years, and one day we'll reach the point where we get 50% of the votes, and then we'll be in a situation to make the revolution. It's really, it, in some ways it's very similar to the other conception, because it has the notion that you know, the revolution is a small group of people, and all they ever do is go and get the votes of other people. All they ever do is, get the support of other people. The revolutionary conception, the real conception, the conception of Marx and Engels, of Lenin, Rosa Luxemburg, of Trotsky, of Gramsci, and so forth, is a very different conception. It understands, uh, the key phrase here is the phrase used by Gramsci, contradictory consciousness, that under capitalism, even today, workers have two sorts of experience. One is the experience of living under capitalism, accepting its ideas, the racism, the homophobia, the sexism, above all the idea that we're workers, therefore inferior, somehow so has to do it for us. But the other experience, the experience of having been involved in struggles, or the memory of struggles, or the sorts of slogans that are in the background of workers' minds, which go through the class. And we have to remember that always there. You know, when people say the 11th commandment is you do not cross picket lines, there's not something confined to people in this room. I mean, I was, uh, uh, it, 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 it's, uh, it's something which you find that it, when you find even trade union leaders denouncing Ken Livingston for talking about walking across picket lines, you know what I'm saying? It's deep, deep in the psychology of a working class with 100, 150 years' experience of struggle. It's a, a distillation 
of what's taken place in the past. We all know how racist the feeling in parts of Lancashire is. But remember the mill strike in Lancashire ten years ago, and workers, without anyone telling them to, went on the picket line, and the slogan was, black and white, unite and fight. Because the logic of being involved in your workplace and going on strike is you give you that idea that go beyond, go beyond capitalism. The point Gramsci made is all workers have these contradictory ideas, but in not an equal, equal mixture. Some workers have much more the experience, and they learn through struggle, much more other workers learn. When you talk about the revolutionary party, you're talking about long before you reach a revolutionary situation, drawing these people together, and then trying systematically to build the networks within the working class, which draw the best of these people together so that they can draw other people around them. So that you begin to create the elements of consciousness, so that the positive side of working class consciousness begins to expand. So that the notion that working class can be the ruling class is there long before. And you understand ideas don't develop just by, just by reading books. It's always the interaction between consciousness and action. If you're revolutionary and you're not involved in any mass action for 50 or 60 years, you'll end up being a non-revolution. You may think revolution is nice, but it won't have any effect. On the other hand, if you're just involved in mass action and you never actually think which class can carry it through and so forth, it's always this interaction. And the revolutionary party grows by those two processes. And what we have to say in the 21st century, the sorts of struggles, the sort of, not non-revolutionary struggles, often revolutionary struggles short of a revolutionary breakthrough, which the potentiality of revolutionaries developing roots inside the working class begin to have an influence among wider sections of workers will take it there again and again and again. And that creates the conditions for the sorts of breakthrough which will take place. I'm not saying, I don't believe it will take through place first in Britain. I'm not that sort of nationalist or chauvinist or so forth. But the breakthroughs will take place. And when they take through, the question of the revolutionary party of the ideas will then become central.